Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to Building All Children's Unhurried Parenting Workshop. We're so happy to have you. Before I introduce our presenter for the evening, I'd like to take just a few moments to tell you a little bit about Building All Children. We're a nonprofit organization that helps every child reach their full potential. We believe that every child needs developmental resources and every single family needs support. That's why at Building All Children, everyone qualifies, regardless of your child's level of development, regardless of your financial situation. We assess children and provide parents the information they need to get their child the help that they need. We connect families with appropriate resources, such as therapists, counselors, physicians, academic um, placement advisors, tutors, <laughs> workshops, support groups, and more. We also empower families through knowledge and support. We provide mothers mentorship through small group um, and learning biblical truths. We provide uh, community building through playgroups and tiny town. And we wanted to invite you to find out even more about Building All Children um, or to donate. You can visit buildingallchildren.org. We would love for you to become a part of our growing BAC community. Um, tonight, as we're here to grow as parents, and our speaker, Kendra Morgan, is going to encourage us to recommit to an unhurried life with our children. Kendra is the founder of Building All Children and a master's level child development specialist. God planted the vision of Building All Children in Kendra's heart more than 10 years ago and has blessed her hands as she continues to build Tulsa's families. I'm so thankful for her obedience and diligence in this mission. Before we welcome Kendra to the stage, I would just like to pray over us and then we can get going. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for tonight. I thank you for every single parent in the room. I thank you that we've all been able to carve out time to recommit to um, just spending more time as intentional parents. Uh, I just thank you for the diligence that these parents have in wanting to support their children. Lord, just give us wisdom and grace as we grow and we learn. And thank you for the children that you've given us. We just pray that everything we say and do here tonight brings glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll help me welcome Kendra. Thank you, Ashley. Ashley runs our Rise and Build program, and so she's in charge of all of our moms and mentor stuff, all of the workshops, and <clears throat> so she has a tough job, and she does a fabulous, fabulous job at it, so we're beyond grateful. Um, I'm Kendra Morgan, and I am the founder of Building All Children. Um, I am a child development specialist. Come on in. Yeah. Um, I, I know, we all should like stare at them. <laughs> When they walk in. I know. I love it. We're like, come in, have a seat. We're grateful. You can kind of pull those chairs apart, too, if we need to. Whatever works best for you guys. I, they're like, we're back row people. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'm glad you're here. Um, I am a child development specialist, but most importantly, I love the Lord with all my heart. And I just want to be obedient to him. So tonight, we're going to talk a lot about that. If that is not your beliefs, there is a reason all is in our name. And um, we serve all children and all families. But I am running a ministry. So we are going to talk about the Bible. We're going to talk about that. Um, but I'm also a wife. For 25 years, I've been married to Ryan. Um, and I always say he is um, the calm in me. Um, I'm the doer, and he always sends these emojis with um, a car and like all this smoke going out of it, telling me to slow down. Um, but he's the calm of me, and so we all, we all need Ryan Morgan in our world. And then we have three children. So I have two in college and one in high school. So mine are older than yours, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to coach you and guide you the best that I can. Um, these books are what this workshop came from. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a real quick story um, of unheard, unhurried. I had a little incident on 169 um, this past year and I ended up kind of getting run off the road and it was just a horrible thing. This car came up on me really, really fast, so fast that I didn't even see her. Um, and I was actually listening to a Bible study at the time and it was just talking about how the more we're in the word, the more we look like Jesus. And so when she flipped me off, I thought it was funny because that's kind of what I was studying. And I think that made her mad. And so my reaction was wrong. But anyways, long story short, um, I, 
I got scared. I mean, I was scared. And um, I just spent some time going, what do you want me to take from that? Why did that happen to me? Was I just at the wrong place at the wrong time? And why are we in such a hurry? And so I really just kind of started studying it. And I decided I was going to take the bad and make it into something good. So out of all these books and out of that little incident I had, I kind of created this unhurried parenting. Most of this comes from books. It's not my made up knowledge. Um, I'm pretty big on research and, and teaching the truth. Um, so what is unhurried parenting? How do we slow down in the busy world we live in? That is what we're going to talk about. And I love those baby coos. Don't stop it. Like we're all about that. We want those coos. Um, so the main thing tonight I want you to realize is you're building little humans. And so you are building these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds to be a husband and a wife. And you're teaching them to hold a job someday and to drive down 169 and respond appropriately. Like, does that scare anyone in here? Ah. I have a 16 year old, so I'm always like, dear Lord, I, th I think anytime they get their driver's license, it increases your prayer life. But um, that's what you're doing. And so how do you do it? And it sounds so silly, right? You're like, okay, well, I have a three year old and I don't even get a shower during the day. So I don't really think I'm building a human. Well, you are. And so we're gonna talk about how you do that and how do you make that little thing turn into something beautiful. It takes time. And there's no quick answer to parenting. If there was, I would write a book and we wouldn't be here. We would all be in Hawaii or somewhere, right? So, um, but we're gonna talk about um, building little humans and what that looks like. So this is the content for tonight. We are gonna talk about confused parenting. I feel like there is a reason that when you walk into a bookstore, there are two to three aisles of books on parenting, right? It's hard. There's so many theories. There's so many disciplines. Um, what's right? What's wrong? Um, when I was raising my kiddos, baby wise was the thing. And I just had this gut feeling like, I just don't know about that. And so I think the world we live in right now, there's just a lot of of stuff that kind of confuses us. We meet with a lot of families. I just met with one last week and they said, Kendra, I'm not disciplining because I don't know what to do. I'm so confused on what's right, what's wrong. Spanking's wrong, timeout's wrong, time in's wrong, redos, I don't know what that is. I mean, she was so, I mean, so upset. And I said, this is the deal. It's, it's not that confusing. We just have to work through it. So that's what we're gonna kind of talk about. Stillness and time. Can a three-year-old really sit still? Should you expect your child to sit at dinner? We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna work through some of that. Buildings, um, boundaries and rules, I love it. I hear giggles. I get it, I get it, I've had littles. Boundaries and rules, are you setting healthy boundaries for your home? Do you have rules for your home? What are they? Are they age appropriate? Technology and contracts, and um, we're gonna talk a little bit about technology and what that looks like. Surrounding and drowning, how in the world do you surround and drown your home with the truth? It's your home, you're the one in charge of it. How do you do that? We're gonna talk about it. Praying and preparing, I'm gonna teach you that. Sibling rivalry, surely. Does anyone struggle with that in here? Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna talk about it. It's actually healthy. It's good for them to fight. Um, it's good for them to argue. And so we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about what your role is in those little arguments. Um, and then we're gonna talk about flaming arrows. So first, I want you to look at this picture and I want you to tell me what you see. A lady with her head turned. Do you see an older lady or a young lady? I see lady? You see a young lady. Who in here sees a young lady? Okay. Who in here sees an old lady? Okay. Who in here sees nothing and has no idea what anyone's talking about? <laughs> okay, good. A really huge, oh, a wife's like, oh. Um, he's, do you see it? Do you not see it? I always have two that never see anything. So this is the deal. There is an old lady and there is a younger lady. Um, once you see one, it's really hard to see the other. But the older lady, um, she has like a feather. This is her hat. That's her big nose and her chin. Do you see the older lady? Those that see the younger, that's the curve of her nose. An eye and an eye. Do you see the old lady now? The, yes, okay, I love it. The younger girl, this is, she's looking away. So that is like her nose and her eyelash. That's her jawline, maybe a necklace. So she's got a little head. Do you see the younger girl? So this is why I showed this tonight. Because everybody's gonna see this a little different. Because it's made for you to see different. 
They say that if you hang out with older people, you're around a lot of adults, you're gonna see the older lady. If you hang out with kids, immediately you're gonna see the younger lady. I don't really know if that's true, but what I do know is um, that's the way this presentation is gonna be tonight. Some of you are gonna be like, I got this, I'm doing great in that. And then some of you are gonna be like, I need to work on this. And that's what I want. I want you to focus on you in your home, in your household, in your children, in your marriage, and we're gonna work on that. And it's gonna look totally different. So someone might be taking notes and you might not need to, and then I get to the next slide and you might really be taking notes. Okay, and so that's why I wanted to show you this. This is gonna be different. This presentation is gonna be a little different for everybody because everyone's in a different spot, okay? Okay, so let's talk about confused parenting. So this is what we know. Um, we used to be really big on discipline. And, um, and then I think what's happened is now we're really big on connection and meeting them where they are, um, not telling them no, just meeting them where they are and helping them kind of, kind of monitor their behavior where, where they are. This is the deal. True discipline is connecting. And so I think when you're trying to connect with your kid, you naturally discipline them. My opinion, um, and I'm, I, I will stand firm in this, is that children need to hear the word no. It is okay for them to learn the word no. When they are born, they 100% depend on you to take care of them, right? And as they get older and as they start talking and as they start making choices, it is our job to mold those consequences. So if they have a choice and they make a choice, they have a consequence with that. And it is a life skill that they will do their whole life, right? If they get older and they have a job and they tell their husband, well, sorry, I just didn't want to, or they tell their boss, sorry, I just didn't really want to do that project. Chances are they might lose their job, right? So it is okay to discipline them. It is very biblical. So Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9, it says to teach them again and again and again. So you teach them in the morning and it says to teach them at night. You teach them when you put them to bed. You teach them when they wake up. You teach them throughout the day. It even tells you to write it on their forehead. Please don't write all over their forehead, but that's what it tells you to do. Um, you're supposed to write it on your doorpost because you're supposed to be teaching them again and again and again. And I think it's a healthy reminder that parenting is not easy. There is no right answer. You're not gonna teach them one time and be like, whew, I'm really good at this. It just doesn't happen that way. So you're gonna be tired because you're gonna teach them again and again and again. But discipline is connecting. It ha they have to be taught right from wrong. And so if you kind of come down here, there's different forms of discipline. And I honestly think you have to use all of these. And you're gonna learn when it works, when it doesn't work. And I think the beautiful thing is if you have a husband or a wife in the home with you, um, it's okay to kind of giggle and be like, well, that didn't work very well, right? Because you're gonna have another chance to do it. But saying, I can't do it, he won't listen to me anyways, I'm gonna give in, I get it. You're gonna have days you give in, right? But what happens is if you consistently give in and give in and give in, they don't realize that once they're told something, they're supposed to do something. And really, a two-year-old should be able to follow directions. They really should. So it's that back and forth connection that you have to make with them. So we had a speech pathologist um, come to one of our baby playgroups, and she talked about looping. Who in here has babies? Um, 20 months and younger. Okay, so there, there's all this research. I challenge you to look it up. It's called 16 by 16 and look it up, it's, it's all this new research that's incredible. But basically, there's this research that if we teach a 16-month-old should have 16 gestures. Um, and so when she taught all this, I was like, that's interesting. So I really started reading it, and it makes so much sense. Because what we're seeing are the kids that come to us, we're not seeing them connect with us back and forth. And so that's, that's when a four-month-old should be able to loop like four times. A six month old should be able to loop like six times. Like you want them to loop back and forth. So that's when you hold them up and you coo and you put them down and you coo and you just kind of keep going back and forth. You make a facial expression, they make a face. That's a loop. It's any kind of looping you can do. Well, so the gestures are the same thing. So a gesture is like high five, knuckles, peace sign. Um, you want them to have waving. Um, I'm trying to think of more of them. Um, yes, thank you, kisses. 
um, please, um, more. I mean, some of that's sign, but that's still considered a gesture. So the more that you can do that back and forth, the more they start to build conversation skills. Um, and it's, you guys, it's so important because we're seeing more and more children, Melissa, I think there's people out there. We're seeing more and more children really struggling with just kind of going back and forth. Another way you can teach this, if you have a three, four, five-year-old, is to put them in front of you and to take a ball and roll it back and forth and see how many times they can do it with you. I think you'll be amazed. It's, they'll do it one time and then they're gonna chunk it. And you're gonna be like, no, 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 we're doing this back and forth. And so you're gonna roll it and you're gonna touch their leg. You just connected their neuron. They're gonna roll it back and you're gonna roll it. You're gonna touch their leg, connect to that neuron. And the more they can go back and forth, you are building conversation skills. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so that's what discipline is. So we believe in time out. We believe in time in. Who in here doesn't know what a time in is? Okay. So time is in is when they do something wrong. Instead of getting upset with them, um, you're going to be like, come here, Jack. Come here, buddy. We're going to have a time in. You're not holding him, but you're having a time in and you're sitting right next to him. We kind of call it hip to hip. And you're going to talk to him. Now, Jack doesn't really care what you have to say. So Jack is probably pretty upset and he's crying and screaming. And if he, we call development from a one to a five. It's if he's red at a five, you don't even waste your breath. You just sit with him until he calms down. Um, and just, it's okay to meet him where he is. Connect with him and say, Jack, I understand. You're really upset that you hit your sister. I understand, I understand. Just get with him. And then it's a time in. And while he's calmed down, time in, that's when you quickly talk about it. And it's not a 10 minute lecture, it's about a minute. I mean, it is quick. It's like, Jack, you can't hit your sister. So you tell him what he did wrong, and then you're gonna tell him um, how that made either sister or made him feel. You're gonna tell him the motion behind it. And then you're gonna tell him what he could have done different. Because to be honest, Jack doesn't know what he could have done different. Jack just knows sister told his, stole his toy and he's really upset with her and so he pops her. So you have to label the behavior, tell him the emotion behind the behavior and then what he could have done different. And then you're gonna praise him. And you're gonna be like, I loved our time together. I know you're gonna do better, Jack, go. And you're gonna give him a little hug and he's on his way. That's a time in. And time ins, you're gonna do them a lot. I mean, they're gonna be done all throughout the day and throughout the night. Redos, does anyone not know what a redo is? Okay, a redo is where, um, well, I used to say we would rewind. Kids don't know what that is anymore, so don't say that. Um, I used to be like, let's rewind. My kids used to be like, Arch! and we would rewind, but they don't use rewind anymore. Um, a, re a redo is when you walk in and you see Jack punch sister. You immediately say, oh, Jack. We're not gonna hit. I'm gonna give you a redo. Let's redo it and make it fun, back it up and say, okay, instead of punching sister, and sister's crying, it's okay, let her cry. You're backing up. Jack, instead of hitting sister, what could we have done? We could have screamed, no! Or we could have came and got me. Which do you wanna do? He's gonna act it out. He's like, I wanna scream no, go for it. No! High five Jack and then check on sister. It's just a way of teaching that's a little bit more fun, but it's still connecting and it's still teaching. Does that make sense? Okay, um, natural consequences. I do believe kids have choices for the, or have consequences for the choices they make. Um, I also think that their consequence has to go with what, their, what the choice they made. So, you know, I don't know if they flush a golf ball down the toilet and then you take TV away, that's weird. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of a weird example because you can't take the toilet away. But, um, but kind of make it go along with what, what, what the consequence should be, should go with along with their choice, if that makes sense. So if they hit brother with a toy, he probably loses that toy, right? That's a good consequence. Um, take away, it's okay to take things away. Um, this is the deal. I'm a big fan, kids like technology. And if they don't meet your expectations, it's okay to take it away from them. I 100% understand it makes your day harder, right? It does. Um, that's how you get your shower and that's how you get your quiet time. But sometimes it's gonna have to be taken away. So it's a punishment on you, but you're teaching them in the long run, I promise. Um, gentle parenting talks about um, not saying no. Um, I actually read um, that book. To be honest, there's some great stuff in it. I do believe um, the parenting part is right. And so you just have to teach them yes and no, and you have to discipline them. Redirecting them is changing their thought process and redirecting them to something else. 
Um, role playing, I'm a big fan of role playing, which I kind of taught you how to do that. Grounding for other kids, um, and it's okay to make them serve some time. Um, not prison, but serve in a church or serve at Building All Children, we would love it. Um, thoughts or questions with any of that? Nope, good. Okay, stillness and time. So, what does stillness, stillness mean? And um, can kids really sit still? This is the deal, stillness has to be planned because the world we live in does not have any stillness. And so we get families all the time that tell us we can't go out to dinner, we, our kids don't know how to sit. Um, I ask every single family that comes to our office, do you sit down and have dinner together? And they always say, yes, we do, with the TV on. And so they're not sitting still and they're not, they're not enjoying the meal with you. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that with the boundaries. Um, but children have to learn to sit still. So this is how we teach it. You are going to have them lay on their bellies and put some pressure on their tummy and you're gonna lay on your tummy if you can and you're just gonna stare at each other. Um, they, if they don't have much stillness in their life, they are gonna be able to do it for about five seconds, maybe, um, which is great. Then you're gonna move on to 10 seconds and you're gonna move on to 30 seconds and it's, they think it's silly, they think it's fun. Dim the lights, say, no, 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 we're doing stillness. We're just doing stillness. And it's biblical, the Bible tells us to be still. We have to be still to hear the Lord. So you have to teach your kids to be still. Um, and then you're gonna slowly work that time up. Um, it is important for them to learn to sit at the table. So I would start it as soon as you can. If you're thinking, oh, I have an eight year old and we've never done it, I would start it now when we get to boundaries, we'll kind of talk about that. Just know that time is precious and you have to manage it wisely. So I know that there's, it's different, the activities are outside of school. Um, when we get to the boundaries, we'll talk a little bit about managing that time, but I would be a big fan of allowing them to be in activities that they enjoy. We hear it all the time. We enrolled him in soccer, he hates it. It's a nightmare to get to practice. It's horrible Saturday mornings. He won't participate, we're so embarrassed. And I'm always like, why are we doing this? <laughs> he doesn't like it. And they always say, because we wanna teach him to finish something. I'm like, he's three. He is not gonna remember this. He's not. So pick and choose those battles wisely. Know that they need to be in an activity they enjoy. There are some kids you kind of have to push, right? You could enroll them in everything and they're gonna hate everything. So kind of know your kids. Some of them, I mean, our oldest, we kind of had to push her in stuff. Now our middle was crazy athletic and she got to be in more stuff because that's how she thrived. If she could go run, jump and play, that whole Morgan household was a little bit better. So we let her be in more stuff. So you just have to know your kids and know the limits with that. But time is precious. If you are literally every night loading up in the car, running through Chick-fil-A, running to the activities, running home, stop and look at it and figure out what you can change. My favorite story with that is um, every year, like I don't even know, maybe third grade, my kids had an apple day. And my two older girls, I took them to the store, I let them buy the apple, and then we went home and we washed it with support, you know, the soap and they got a towel that they got to wrap it up with and we put a bow on it. And my son was my third kid and it was apple day and I forgot. And so I just grabbed an old beat up apple and handed it to him. And I mean, I felt horrible. As I like, here I had all these bonding moments with my girls, never had that moment with Jace. And I remember it was about a year and a half ago, we were talking and I said, do y'all remember your apple day? And all of them were like, what apple day? And I was like, the apple day that we went to the store and we bought the apple and we washed it and we wrapped it up and put a bow on it. The girls were like, no, I don't remember that. And I was like, Jace, do you remember your apple day? And he was like, no. And I just thought, oh, was that a waste of my time? So just pick your battles and know that if you give them an old apple, it's probably gonna be okay. They still had an apple, right? And if you're that parent's like, I didn't even get them an apple, that's probably okay too. They're not gonna remember. Um, so stillness needs to happen. And the only way they start to learn stillness is by you putting it in place. Okay, so let's talk about boundaries and rules. I do recommend these two books. Um, this one's more for you. If you don't know how to set boundaries, um, I highly recommend this one. Um, and then the same author, they came out with this one for kids. And so Janelle Carter actually did a whole workshop on this and it was 
fabulous. Um, so I will, hers was like, I don't even know, four nights. I won't be able to go into it that in depth, but the books are great. So building boundaries. So this is what I want you to know. The boundaries are so healthy, but I think we don't know how to set them. So we just kind of ignore them. Um, and so I would encourage you to draw a house, a pretty simple house, and that is your home. And we're going to talk about how to set boundaries for your home. First, it is okay to say no. Know that they need to understand that, I mean, scripture says, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Anything in between can be evil. So just let them know that you're going to say no, and that is okay. I know they came out with this thing where they had like certain yes days where you had a day where all you said was yes. Some of my friends said, did that. I didn't ever do that, but it sounds fun. Um, and then just know it's a team effort that um, when you set boundaries that they're kind of in charge of these boundaries too because it's your household rules. And so you have to give them some ownership in the boundaries. So out of the book, I took a little bit of notes just so I could sum it up for you. Um, the main thing with boundaries, number one, is that you need to know that your role as a caregiver is to make them feel safe. Number one, that is the number one boundary is for them to feel safe. And the way that they feel safe is by being fed, having a warm place to lay down, having a roof over their head and having their main needs met. That's the number one rule. OK, the second is after they feel safe and they have those boundaries, then they start to build some character. So they learn to be empathetic. They learn to be loving um, and they start to kind of build who they're going to be. But they have to feel safe in order to do all that. Then you get to be the influencer. So this is where you step in, you start teaching them, you start molding them um, and you're teaching them right from wrong and how to appropriately respond. Building boundaries develops consequences, responsibility, respect, gratefulness, um, and higher confidence. That's research based. Um, it also, strong boundaries also help with the three main things, emotional, attitude, and behavior. So they're pretty important. Um, the books also talk about the more that you have home routines, the more when you go out and you sit at a restaurant, the better they'll set for you. But if you never have them set at home, chances are they're not gonna know how to set in a restaurant. So how do you build boundaries? Well, so basically you're gonna build that home, right? You're gonna know that home. And you're gonna know that it is the woman's job to build the home. That's what scripture says. It says that the woman, a wise woman builds her home, but a folly will tell her, tear it down. And this is the deal. We're gonna all tear our home down. And the beautiful thing is that we get to wake up the next morning and build it back, right? And so we have to have boundaries and we have to, our kids have to know our expectations or chances are our home's gonna be a little chaotic. Now, if you have really healthy boundaries, does that mean your home is never chaotic? No, I wish, right? We have littles, you're gonna have some chaos in your home. But the more boundaries you have when the chaos happens, you can get them back in and get those boundaries set, okay? <coughs> So how do you set healthy boundaries? It really determines on what you guys want your needs to be. So some of the boundaries and rules, um, and this is just kind of ours, and so you guys have to figure out what's important to you. And honestly, this is a really healthy conversation on your way home. I would draw a house on that little piece of paper and say, let's talk about this. What do I want my home to be like? What kind of boundaries do we want? What kind of rules do we want set? So for us, church was important. We knew that if you raised your child in church, percentage for them to go to church when they got out of your home is higher. So we were kind of no, no, I mean, no matter what, they were going to church. Now, my kids played athletes. Did that sometimes waver it? Yes, it did. Um, but that was just one of our rules. And my son knows that. I mean, he'll still say, I have so much homework and I'm tired, but I know I'm going to youth. And I'm like, yeah, you are. Um, because it's a rule. It's one of the boundaries that we have. Um, extracurricular activities, like I said earlier, you have to pick and choose which ones you guys want. Um, sleepovers, I think those need to be established really early. So we just made the rule that you are not allowed to sleep over at anyone's house if I don't know them. And it's not like, well, you met Jack's mom yesterday. No, I need to know them before you sleep at the house. And so we taught it early, early on. You'll be surprised, slumber parties start happening really early. And so our rule was, if I don't personally know them, they cannot stay the night and you cannot ask me in front of them. You know who I know. Um, that was just kind of our rule. And the rule was, if you want Jill to stay the night, of course my daughter wants Jill to stay the night, 
then, uh, or if you want to stay the night with Jill and I don't know her parents, she can stay the night with us. Anyone's welcome at our house, um, but you can't stay the night with anyone if we don't know their parents. And we just set that early on. And for the most part, it was pretty good. Um, there were a few times that we had to kind of work through things. Um, phones, we're going to talk a lot about technology, um, so we'll get to that. But I think it's so important to really set healthy boundaries. I think it's important for you guys while you have littles to set healthy boundaries because I am about 100% sure one of the reasons these kids that are coming to us aren't having a lot of communication is because they're seeing a lot of this. Um, whether it's them or whether you get five minutes and you can sit down and look at it, they're not getting that interaction. Um, I've even, I did a classroom observation and on the playground I saw the teacher do that. And it's a great opportunity to have conversation back and forth. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about phones. Um, grades, grades were important to us. We set high expectations on grades and it really wasn't about getting an A, but it was about working as hard as you can work. Um, and to this day, we will say, did you work as hard as you can work? And every once in a while, they'll be like, no. And then if you worked as hard as you can work and you got a C, I'm fine with that. But it's about working hard. Friendships, um, you have to set boundaries with friendships and then expectations, um, manners, and you just have to figure out what your expectations are. But I promise you, if they know your expectations, they ca the chaos will lower in your home. I promise it will. Any thoughts with boundaries? It's, we could probably do, well, we have. Janelle's created a whole workshop on it because it's a lot. Any thoughts or questions with it? So with your expectations, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. I think you're not bringing that expectation up to put them down. Like, that's not our goal. But our goal is to remind them of that expectation. So for us, our number one, even when our kids are itty bitty, is we wanted them to work hard. Whatever they did, we wanted, because I believe if you are to learn to work hard, you'll have success with whatever you do, right? So we would just teach them, like, no, if you're going to clean up your toys, you work hard. Look how sloppy that is. I know you can do better. I expect you to work hard. Get after it, buddy. And then I'd walk away, you know? So I think it's that's how you do it. It's not like, well, you did a terrible job on that. And my expectation is that's not what it's about. It's just throwing it in there so they know you have high standards for them. Kids like to have rules. They like to have boundaries. They like to, they like to have that respect. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you're going to say it all day long, probably. Um, okay. And then household rules. I do believe in household rules. And we have parents all the time say, what? Are, what? I like, n quiet voice, no running. I'm like, uh, make them simple. So take care of others. Take care of you. And take care of your stuff. Um, you can make it more biblical. Take care of others. Take care of you. Take care of the stuff that the Lord gave us. Um, anything they do fits in one of these rules. So let's say Jack comes home and throws his lunchbox down in his backpack. Wait a minute. What's rule number three? We take care of our stuff. Put your stuff up. What's it doing on the floor? Um, take care of you. Let's say they didn't brush their teeth. Well, wait a minute. What's our number two rule? It's to take care of you. Go brush your teeth. I mean, so anything they do fits in one of those rules. Um, and it's just an easy way to kind of have those expectations. Does that make sense? Okay. Thoughts or questions? Nope. Okay. Let's talk technology. So a couple things. I did a whole huge old workshop on this. So I gave you my handouts so that you have all of this information and you have all of my resources too, I think. Yes, you have the resources. So this is the deal with technology. Um, who in here has, does anyone have middle school kids? Okay. Um, high school kids? Wow. Okay. Um, okay. Good. This is great. So that's why parenting is hard. <laughs> um, technology makes parenting really hard. Um, and I get that. So this is what research shows with technology. 60% of children that have some form of device, which is typical cell phone, have no parent monitoring. Does that surprise you? So the 40%, if that is you, chances are your kid is sitting next to someone on the bus that is this, or walking to class, or, so this, I hear it all the time, well, we're not giving him a phone. Okay, that's great, he's got a phone on the bus. Like, you've got to just teach them right from wrong, right? So this is the thing that I recommend, and this was not 
this was not our thing. And um, we got it from Camp Kennecook. But I believe that any device that a kid has, um, it should have a contract with it. And you teach children how to write contracts. Um, and I should have brought some of my contracts. I brought them a long time ago when I did this and I had a couple of people take pictures of them and they're just, I mean, my kids wrote them, they're kind of personal, but um, you teach them how to write a contract. So a contract states, one, why do they want the device? And then um, two, what are the rules with the device? And under each rule, what are their consequences? And this is the deal. My, all of my kids, their consequences were so much harder than I would have ever. So for instance, like our middle, my Addie was like, if I lose my phone, I'm gonna buy me a phone and you a new phone, mom. And I'm like, great, that's awesome. <laughs> so I mean, she, you know, that's wonderful. But we made him, um, we talked about sending an image is off. You, you send any inappropriate image, the device is ours. Now, this, these kids are older. So um, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about family meetings. Um, we called family meetings all the time, and I'll never forget, Maggie, our oldest daughter, called a family meeting, and the rule with family meetings is anyone calls a family meeting, you have a family meeting, you meet. No matter what you're doing, you drop it and you meet. So we dropped everything and we met, and she knows her dad, and so she had like all these notes and kind of these statistics, and she was sharing with him that she's the only child in Jinx Middle School that does not have a phone and that I mean, she like read all this stuff to him and life's just terrible and I'll never forget my husband took a deep breath and he was like Maggie I'm so grateful to know that if I need to get a hold of you I have a lot of kids I can call to get a hold of you <laughs> and she was so mad about it but this is the deal we were set apart and we decided when was best for them to get a phone. And it gets really, really, really complicated, you guys, because I'll never forget when I dropped off one of my kids' lunch at the intermediate, they said, will you text her? And I was like, she doesn't have a phone. And they're like, well, we don't call them, so can you text one of her friends? And I knew then that it, I mean, it's different. It's, it, you're raising kids in a different world, right? But you have to set those boundaries and you have to set those expectations. But you also have to know that when they get their phone, there's rules. So have them write a contract. I promise you, we have gone back to those contracts. It's, we talk about grades in those contracts. We talk about expectations. We talk about talking rude to someone and making someone feel bad through a text. We talk about talking too blunt in a text that you wouldn't do in person. It's easy to type, type behind a screen. Um, we also had our girls never take selfies. You don't take a selfie for someone to tell you you're pretty. That's not why you take a picture. And so those are the things that we really worked hard on with technology. And I think it's so, so, so important for you guys to manage your kids' screen time. So on this is some devices that you can look up. So the Teen Safe is a great one. Um, Covenant Eyes is another great one. If, if you think, oh, my kid will never do it, I just want you to know your sweet angel kid lives in a really mean world and they will end up seeing it. So our thing was, we knew it was gonna happen, we just had open communication. If it happens, come to us and let's talk about it. You will never be in trouble with this, but we need to, we need to know. If we find out and you didn't tell us, it's a whole different ball game. Um, so just really make them feel safe with it um, and, and, and monitor it. You guys have to monitor it. So what I love is, um, the 12 ways that a phone changes you, you might read through that and see if some of those make you feel that way. We get on Facebook and we think it makes us feel connected, but it really makes us feel really lonely. You're not really connecting with anyone. Um, that was one of our things too, is if you had a device and you weren't commenting or liking stuff, then you don't need it because you're not gonna sit and just scroll through it. But if you're liking other people's things and you're making a comment, then to me that is connecting a little bit. But if you're not gonna do any of that, then really you shouldn't have it. If you're just scrolling to see other people's lives, it's just not healthy. So that was one of our rules we had too. Um, what the phone doesn't teach your children, it doesn't teach them conversation skills, it doesn't teach them body language, um, it doesn't teach them self-awareness, it doesn't teach them empathy. So research shows that empathy has to be taught. Um, does anyone in here know how you teach empathy? Do you want me to tell you how you teach empathy? So the way you teach empathy is you teach them the, how their reactions affect somebody else. So let's say you're pregnant and Adam is just screaming bloody murder. You'd be like, Adam, 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 you 
are hurting the baby's ears. You're screaming is hurting the baby's ears. So you're teaching Adam that his screaming is affecting the baby's ears. That is how you teach empathy. You have to teach them that their reaction and their emotions affect other people. So when Jack walks in and hits Amanda, instead of just saying, Jack, no, it's more like, oh, Amanda, I bet that really hurt when Jack hit you. Jack, you can't, you can't hurt her. And that's how you teach empathy. And it has to be taught. Our brain is hard, hardwired for anxiety, fear, anger. It, we're natural. Um, but the kindness and gentleness and empathy has to be taught. That's research-based. Any questions with technology? OK, well, there's your handout with all your resources. So you'll be that 40%, not the 60. No, you're great. Can you give us like a handout on like, more examples of contracts? I, yes. I, like I could maybe work on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could. I feel like that could get so overwhelming. You, like, make so you make it really simple. I mean, they're, you should see my kids. They were so little. And we taught them, like, nope, we don't agree. That, that consequence is not good enough. So think about it. What could you change? And they'd come back, well, we like that one, and so we'd help them write it, and then we would all teach them to initial. If there's a change in the contract, you initial it. But contracts get complicated. My daughter decided she didn't want her hamster, and my son and her wrote up a contract that ownership went to my son. My son <laughs> changed his name in the contract, and the hamster died like a week later. So I mean, you know, we kind of created con um, contract monsters, but I, I think it's important to know that you're just you're literally stating what every device they had. So if it was an iPad, if it was a phone, if it was an iTouch, they had those little iTouches. I mean, any device they had, they had a contract for. Um, it's easy to do, it's connecting, it's family time, it's teaching them right and wrong, and it's, it's, I would, it's the greatest thing. We've had to pull it out so many times and been like, dude, I didn't make this. I didn't make this the consequence, I'm sorry. Um, and sometimes they'd be like, I was 12 when I wrote that. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's still good. Um, so I would, I would encourage you to do it. Yeah, I really would. It'd make things better. But yeah, I can maybe do that. What age does that start where it's like, they can understand? Um, you know, I mean, like our kids didn't get phones until past middle school, but they got like um, eye touches. They listened to music and they wrote one for that. So intermediate, they were writing that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I could go back and look date-wise to get you a, a clear answer on that, but they were pretty little. I mean, I know everything's misspelled and stuff, you know, um, and there's a few things we had to be like, what was that word? <laughs> um, so they were pretty young, yeah. I mean, anytime they, if they're not old enough to write a contract, they're not old enough to have a device, in my opinion. So if they can't do it, then they shouldn't have an iPad or, a, you know. It's kind of a healthy boundary for that, that my opinion. Um, okay, so surround and drown your home. So this is what we know, right? We know that the woman is the one that's, the wise woman builds her home, but a folly can tear it down. But we also know that the man's job is to lead the home. Um, whatever your child puts in their mind goes into their heart. So it is all day long that you are teaching them the truth and teaching them the word. Um, be careful with the music that is playing. Be careful with the commercials that are on. Be careful what movies you watch. Um, we have kids all the time that we end up doing anxiety and they're scared to death, but they've been watching scary movies with older brothers and sisters. And so kids just don't get reality skills until age seven. And so they don't, I mean, that's like when, you know, 9-11 happened and the airplane crashed into the building. They said over and over, kid, kids thought that it was happening over and over and over again because they didn't have the reality skills of that was the same plane in the same building. And so they just don't have those reality skills. And so you have to be careful what you allow their eyes to see because they can't, they can't break it down and process it and know what to do with it. Um, so be careful what you allow to go into their mind. Um, and know that whatever you put into their mind goes into their heart. So I'm a big fan of teaching them scripture. I would have it all over your house. If you have a hard time memorizing it, then write it out and stick it all over the place. Um, I used to put them in their socks, so when they opened up their socks, the scripture would pop out. I used to put it in the <clears> lunch, <throat> and I would say, um, have your teacher read this to you. And so that way, they, the whole class heard a scripture. And so just think how you can put as much scripture in them throughout the day as possible. Um, 
The other one is just know that your job is to mold them and to teach their hearts to know Jesus. Um, and the whole goal is for them to find the others that don't know Jesus and teach them about him. Um, but the only way that you do that is by teaching them the Bible. And it's really and truly the only thing that is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so we are living in a little bit of a scary time with all that. And the only thing we can cling on to is the truth. And so I'm a big fan of being in the Word, being in the Bible, um, and memorizing it. Because I always tell my kids, if your Bible got taken away, what would you know? We take, for, we take it for granted that they're everywhere, um, but they need to know it and they need to have it in their heart. Um, and then Matthew 7, um, it's the story where it talks about that you build your house on a solid foundation. And if you're building your house on sand, when the wind comes and the rain comes and the storm comes, you're going you're gonna to have a hard time. But if your home is built on a solid foundation, when that rain comes and that storm comes, your, your home's not going to waver. And so I, I challenge you to build those roots and to build them strong. It comes from your marriage. It's what it comes from. And so you build that strong, then chances are, and I promise you, you're going to have a storm. You are. It's biblical. You're going to have a storm. It might just be a rainstorm. It might be a hell storm. And it could be a tornado. But when it hits, if you're on a solid foundation, chances are you're going to make it through that storm. And so that's an expectation. Your kids have to understand. I mean, it, parenting is hard, and it's not perfect. Um, if you don't have any idea what any of that means, I would love to meet with you and teach you more about that. Um, does anyone have thoughts or questions with any of that? No? OK, we did bring Bibles. Melissa brought some of these out. We have a lot of Odyssey Bibles. I love the Action Bible, especially for boys. Um, the Action Bible actually has a CD. We don't have the CD, but oh my gosh, I swear that's how my son knows the Bible. Um, he would just play that CD all the time and follow along. And to this day, he remembers things that I don't even know. Um, I will warn you, God's voice is deep on that. And I was doing laundry one time, and it was like, the, and I literally thought I had a man in my house. I was like looking for a bat. And then I was like, who is that? And Jason's like, what? I'm like, who's here? And he's like, God. And I was like, what? So just know that God's voice is really deep on that. Um, and then we love the Jesus Story Bible. So, um, but yeah, these are good. And these you guys can take. And if they're all gone and you need more, we can run back and get you some. Um, praying and preparing. So this is the thing. And I'm going to say this um, gently. I say it, I think, every time I speak. Chances are, if you are not praying for your child, nobody is. It's just the role that we have. So I challenge you to pray together, and I challenge you if you're like, we don't ever pray together. I don't even know how to do that. You have to do it in, in a pattern. So I would pray with them in the morning at breakfast. I would pray with them anytime you sit down at the table, at lunch, if you get to have lunch with them, or at dinner. I would definitely pray on the way to school. It's, if you're not the bus and you're the crazy person that takes your kids to school, I would pray in the car um, about their day and, and about them. Um, it's an easy way to just kind of get in the habit of start praying with them. It's so important to put name in their scripture. So I have a couple books. Um, if you want these, we have a couple. We do have those prayer journals with the scriptures. I could have pulled those. Um, Laurie Hembree is amazing. And she writes a topic, and then she breaks all these scriptures up where you put a kid's name in it. Um, so let's say you have a little one that hates sleeping alone, hates their bedrooms, having night terrors. I would read Psalms 91 to them. Um, it talks about the angels will protect them. And um, every time it says you, I would put in Michael. I would put in Jack. I would put in their name. Not that we're about changing scripture, but we're about making scripture personal. And so um, we have some books. She has not had these printed yet. Um, they're incredible. When they're printed, we will somehow send you the link. Um, she's in the process of getting them printed. And then she just had these printed, which I can send you that link to. But um, it's called Praying for Your Children. And it's a Bible study. And it takes, it takes all these scriptures and teaches you how to put them um, in that. I, ha I wish I would have brought mine. I have her first old version. Um, we actually, she's, in, she's an incredible writer. She's here in Tulsa. Um, I did the first one, I went through the whole thing, and then I felt like it was so good I wanted to go through it again. So then I changed my pen color, and I did it again. And as I was going through it, I was like, oh, God answers prayers. I don't know why that surprises me, but he just does, right? Um, and so um, just know that you have to pray for them. 
Get on your knees. If you have something come up and you're worried about something, I challenge you to sneak in while they're sleeping and get on your knees and pray over them. Um, if you don't know how to pray, it's a beautiful way to do it because nobody hears you but God. Um, I have welcomed my kids up a few times before and we have screamed. Um, but on the other side of that, I love that they know that I do that. They don't like it. They're like, don't do that again. I'm like, I'm sorry. Um, but it's actually a beautiful thing that they know we pray for them. So I would encourage you to do that. And then make prayer real. It doesn't have to be simple. Like figure out what, what they're struggling with and pray deep and pray boldly. Um, and then when the Lord answers that prayer, celebrate it. I don't think we celebrate those prayers enough. Um, but he wants us to pray boldly. And so um, one of my daughters went through a season where she felt like she had no friends. And it was so sad to me. And so every night we prayed so boldly that she would just get some really like lifelong friends. She has the greatest circle of friends now. And it's so healthy for her to know that she had a parent that prayed that over her, you know. So know what their struggles are and pray over that. If they're having trouble with speech and language, pray. Ask the Lord to give them new words that you would never even know they would be able to say. Um, ask Him to show up boldly and show up in your child's life and pray. I mean, pray specifically on their development. You'll be kind of blown away. He answers prayers. I mean, it's what the Bible says. It says to knock, ask, and receive. And so knock knock the door down with those prayers thoughts or questions anything you guys do okay sibling rivalry do we have any of that going on so this is the thing and um, research shows so i got all of this out of this book i love it this is the new version i have the old one when my kids are little i think i went to the bookstore very quick and bought that one. Um, so the research shows that siblings have to have roles. If they have roles and they know their expectations and they know they have a special role, they are less likely to fight. So that goes back to your boundaries. The rule is someone sets the table, someone clears off the table, someone put, they have to have specific roles. If they have roles, for instance, it's always Anna's job to grab the backpack. Right? Anna, did you get the backpack? Great. Anna's worried about the backpack. Anna's walking out to the car. Chances are there's not going to be a fight in the car because Anna grabbed the backpack, right? Where it gets tricky is then Jim's like, but I want to grab the backpack. So give him something really special too. And it doesn't have to be different all the time. It doesn't have to be this massive char and you put a sticker. No, don't make it complicated. Just give the children specific roles so they feel important. It will lower the fighting, I promise. When they fight, it is okay to step over them and walk out of their room as long as they're safe. Like if they're really duking it out, you might need to get in the middle of it. But sometimes they just have to figure this out on their own, right? So I always say, the Lord gave us mommies a really good mommy gut. Follow your mommy gut. One time my kids were fighting and I had that mommy gut, like they're taking it too far. So I told them to stop it. My daughter did it one more time, tripped my son and he broke his arm. Okay, so my mommy gut said, stop it. She didn't listen. So follow your mommy gut, right? You have to know when enough is enough. But there are times it's okay if they throw toothpaste on the wall because then it's just a consequence. They have to clean up the toothpaste. They have to learn to kind of work through it. Thoughts or questions with that? I know it's hard. Um, I think moms step in more than dads with that kind of stuff. Um, do you guys have any thoughts or questions with it? And then it's your responsibility to build good feelings. So you have to teach them what the other one is good at and you have to teach them what the other one can help them with. And you have to really and truly foster those relationships because they're the most important relationships they'll have on earth until they get married. They really are, because they're also forever relationships. But you have to foster those relationships. So for one thing we did with our family is every event we went to, we all went, all five went. And I know it sounds crazy. It's expensive, but it was important to me that everyone supported each other. So there were times that Jason didn't want to go to volleyball, but he went because we were going to be together. And um, my son has homecoming this weekend, and both my girls are coming home from college to go to it. And I love it. But I think we established that really early on, that we're going to support each other because you know what? We're a family of five, and we're fighting a big old battle in this big world, and we're going to be together fighting this battle. And they know it. I mean, they know that that's what we're going to do. But you have to teach it. So the things with siblings is you have to teach them to love each other. 
You also have to be a good example. We have parents a lot of times say, my kids scream all the time. They yell at me. And I'm like, chances are, if your kid yells at you, then you're probably yelling in the home. You might not realize it because it's just loud and chaotic. So I always say, if you are a screamer, which some of us are just wired that way, um, don't stop screaming and just use a whisper voice. You'll be blown away at how kids turn to a whisper voice. Just lower your voice, whisper. If you don't have anything nice to say to your husband or to anyone, you hum a Christian song. Just hum. Um, I used to hum all the time when my kids were fighting. And the other, like a year ago, I was humming and Jace was like, something wrong? And I was like, no, why? And he's like, you're humming. I'm like, huh, I'm no, I'm peaceful, I'm just humming. But I just kind of always learned, to, mm, I'm just gonna hum a song and step over him and move on. It's okay to do that. It's teaching them also. And um, the reality is kids want attention, whether it's good attention or bad attention, they just want attention. Um, they're better off getting good attention than bad attention because they're gonna get attention from you somehow. So praise them, give them good attention. The more you give that to them, the more they won't want the bad attention. Life isn't fair and it is okay for them to know that. Um, and so if Jackie gets invited to a birthday party and gets all these gifts, we're gonna be really happy that Jackie got all this stuff. Um, and it's okay that you didn't. You get, didn't get invited to the party. That's okay, you have your own friends. And so, but it's all in how you word it and it's all how you talk about it. Um, and then they're gonna end up telling you that life isn't fair <laughs> when you want something or you say something. But that's okay, life isn't fair, it's true. The best gift you can give them is just teaching them to love each other. Um, and it has to be taught. It has to be an example with words. Thoughts or questions on sibling stuff? I know it can be hard, yes. Not really sibling, but you said to praise them because they want attention. I was a child who doesn't like any kind of praise. Like, yes. Like, he's good looking. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 You know, yeah. know how to receive praise. Yeah. Um, so with him, I would really say, wow, I really respect the way you drew that. It's a different type of compliment. I would start respecting him, and you'll see it. He'll every every boy and man wants to be respected, and so I think it's all in how you phrase that. Like, wow, that shirt! You, I I respect the way you look in that shirt. If wow, that's great, and not a direct compliment to him. It's more about you respect the way he picked out his outfit, or you respect the way he added whatever. You just you respect it. You'll see a difference with that. That's a good question. Thoughts or questions? Okay, the flaming arrow. So the flaming arrow is our job is to raise them and then our job is to send them off. And it is not easy, you guys. Um, but you teach them, you mold them, you create them, and then you send them off. And you know the different stage of the parenting is actually so fun. They're, my kids, my college kids are in this stage now that they kind of make their own choices. And sometimes you just take a deep breath and pray, good Lord, I hope that's the right choice. Um, but I feel like we've raised them, and that's kind of where we are in life. My son, we're still in the process of molding him, but we only have a couple more years left. So my advice to you is it goes so fast, and you have to know what you have control over, right? And so you have control over praying over them. The more you pray over them, the more they're gonna call you and ask you to pray for specific things. My daughters call me all the time for tests, boyfriend stuff, um, they had to vote on this thing, and my daughter called me the other night and asked me to pray. And it's just opened this line of communication. She knows I do it. Um, so they call their dad, too, and ask him to pray for things. So I, the only thing you can do is you have to be in the Word. You have to learn it so you can teach it to them. And it just really honestly has to be daily. So I would find a time throughout your day just to carve out and make it consistent. It does not have to be an hour study. We don't have time for that. I get it but it has to be some form of something. So if you're not a member of Right Now Media, I would encourage you to join Right Now Media. You can go to buildingallchildren.org, scroll all the way down and there's an orange arrow. Click on that and Building All Children pays for you to sign up for free to be a member of Right Now Media. Thousands and thousands of Bible studies, thousands of books or videos for your kids. We're not a huge fan of screen time, but if they have to watch it, they might as well be learning about Jesus. Um, and so I would sign up for that tonight and get into it. You can do a five minute Bible study every morning and it gets you into the truth and into the word. Um, and then sometimes I just leave my Bible out so my kids know I read it. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not afraid to mark it up. I write dates, I write notes um, so that they, I can remember things that happened. 
Um, so mark up your Bible. If you don't know how to do that, we have lots of Bibles that we can give you. You just need to let Ashley know. Um, any thoughts or questions? I gave you the reference page. These, all these books <laughs> are all of these books. Um, for boys, I would highly recommend both of these. Um, they are both incredibly written and they're really and truly all about respect. And um, we have to learn to respect our boys. And um, boys do not like to be made fun of. So sometimes we make little jokes in front of other, our friends to get them to talk. They hate it. Um, girls kind of like that, play a little bit. Boys like to be respected. And so I would encourage these. Um, this love and respect is a great one for marriage. Margin is always good. Boundaries, um, sibling rivalry is a good one. Shepherding a child's heart, um, it's an oldie, but a good one. Um, so you're welcome to come up here. Parenting, it's a note, you can see I kind of like that book. Um, it's a good one. Um, and then these Bibles, if your kids don't have Bibles, we want them to have Bibles. Um, so these books are mine, so please don't take those. These books are BACs and you can take them. Any thoughts or questions? What time are we done? Okay, any thoughts, questions? I would love, I mean, literally, I would love for y'all to just open up and let's talk for just a little bit. I think it's very helpful. I went through a half year old where Billy with, she's the sweetest girl in the movie, says about their kids. But she truly is, she's a little center, we all are. Sure. We're dealing with, you know, and not um, reacting appropriately if, you yeah. know, something happens and doesn't go her way. So a lot of this is beneficial that I can mold at home, but also like replicate at school with her teachers yes. and just have that consistency. So there were a lot of things that were helpful for now, but also looking yes. forward to she yeah. goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thought, I had it in here, but I just took a few slides out because I didn't know how long um, some of this would go. But um, we have a lot of parents ask us about lying. Um, and they're like, my kid just doesn't tell the truth or they'll stretch the truth. And what do we do with that? And um, so the deal with lying is I don't believe that kids are really wired to lie. I think they pick up on telling a story and their story gets attention. And so we always just kind of start out and don't ever say, we don't, we, don't, we don't have liars in our house. Like, don't make it so harsh, especially when they're little. But it's okay to just say, you know what, buddy, that's a great story, but... I don't remember riding in a plane to the moon. So you kind of rephrase the story back and be like, that's a little silly, right? And so you kind of just make it nice to let him know like, yeah, I know you kind of stretched that there, but it really was just a good story. I love your creativity, but you know, sometimes when the words come out of our mouth, they have to be right because Jack might not know that you're really creative. So you're just kind of teaching them in a gentle way like that. Now, if they really start when they're older lying and stealing, that's a whole different thing. And we have some references for that. But younger ones, they just, what happens is they've done one time, they stretch the truth a little bit and they got a reaction from it. And so they're like, oh, that felt kind of good. And so they just want to do it more. Um, so just, just be careful with that. Don't necessarily call them a liar. Just tell them they told a really good story and see if that kind of breaks it. Other thoughts, questions? Um, do, you have, do you have more specific um, suggestions with boys and teaching, like us respecting them, but maybe teaching them to also be respectful or maybe teaching them responsibility in a respectful yeah. way? Like what, yeah. what kind of examples do you have that, that um, happens? No, that's a great question. Um, my main thing is they have to have chores. We're a big fan of kids having chores. And the deal with the chore is chores are something that they can start and they can stop, like they finish it. So they start it and they finish it. That's a chore. Um, a chore isn't you telling them 10,000 times to feed the dog and then they dump the whole bowl. Well, then they have to pick it up. Like that's not, the chore is like, they're consistent. This is what they should do for their age. So number one is having a list of chores. Um, and we have that list too. We should be making a list because I'm like, we'll give that out, we'll give this out. Um, but we have a list of age appropriate chores um, that I think we, we're a big fan of that. And we really like two year olds to be doing chores. I mean, they can wipe down tables. They can help you take out the trash. And I know it makes a big fat mess, right? I get that. But that's also how they learn. Um, but the, I mean, we think that they should be doing chores. The way respect happens is if you respect them, they will learn to respect you. Um, and so you have to know their personalities and know 
what they like and what they don't like, right? And if they don't like to be the center of attention, then don't make them be the center of attention. Um, and so, and they don't like compliments, then don't compliment them. But it's, I guarantee you they want to be respected. Um, so I would read those books. I'm a big fan of respecting them. Um, a lot of times research shows that when kids, you pick them up from school and you say, how was your day? They're like, good. Well, who'd you play with? I don't remember. Well, when you lay them down flat, it's weird, but they remember their day. And so that's when you're exhausted, right? But that's when they're like, hey, Anna Beth told me, and you're like, we don't have time. We already talked about this, go to bed. Just know that, I mean, it's research-based. When they lay flat, they remember their day. So I always say, put 10 minutes on your bedtime. And when you lay them flat and you start talking to them and they start telling you all the stories, soak it up, soak it up. Um, and it's just respect. My son, anytime he gets in the car, he calls me. I don't know why. Um, it's over the, it's over. I mean, he's probably shouldn't be, but I t no matter what I'm doing, you can ask the ladies. I'm like, I gotta go, my son's calling because I don't have it for very much longer. He's gonna get married and quit calling me and he's gonna be calling her someday. And so I think it's just, you have to know what they need from you and you give up part of you to give that to them. And that's respect. But this is the deal. When you do that, then he's gonna end up doing things for you that because you taught him respect. It's not easy, but you have to keep loving them and meeting them where they are and respecting them. And he'll end up respecting you, I promise. You're doing a good job. I see the tears, they're hard. Parenting's hard, it's not easy. I wish I could talk about an easy subject. I could talk about shooting free throws. We could do that, that'd be easy. What else, what other questions do you have? Do you remember the show when it's like, you have a meeting and then they like reform your- Yes. Are you taking out the picture? No, no. This is the deal, no. But this is the deal. It's easy to sit in a chair and talk about how to do things, right? I mean, we had our battles and we had one that had a little bit of sensory. I had one that Ryan, my husband and I were just talking about one. We had one that was crazy picky eater. And when she got into OT, the therapist gave us a, we could make right out 10 things for her to eat. And she was like, not like broccoli. Like, what do you want her to eat? I'm like, like a hot dog and a taco? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, she's never gonna eat this stuff. Um, and you would never know it to this day. She still eats kind of weird, but she eats whatever. Um, and so, I mean, we had our battles. I mean, there were times I went to the church and had him pray over her because I knew she wasn't getting enough nutrition. So it, it's not easy, but you just have to keep building them. I feel like we're getting so many parents that just want a quick fix. And we're not an Amazon store. We don't just order it and throw it at you. What we do is we teach you how to mold and build someone, and it takes time and it's exhausting but I promise you in the long run it's it's a win-win what other thoughts do you have what about you Melissa what do you have to add um I was just thinking um so my middle no. is 10 and all three of my kids have been through the BAC process and my boys came before I even worked for building all children um and with my middle I have just learned and grown so much through that process through the hard hard times because he struggled in daycare in preschool in pre-k and kinder he's in fourth grade now and this is the year where i never thought i'd see it but all those struggles and hard times and the teaching and the molding and the like screaming and the fighting and the crying it's clicked and he is like so empathetic and so, so loving sweet. and so kind and respectful. And so those hard times can bring so much joy at the end of it. And so I think just learning to be thankful, even though it's hard, give praise because at the end of it, it's, there's gonna be goodness on the other side of that. So when you get to see that, it's really, really sweet. It's worth it. Yeah. I sit across women from a table that have no struggles in their life and it makes me sad because they don't need Jesus. And then I sit across the table from women that are, I mean, deeply struggling. And I see them building this relationship with Christ that is forever. It's the only thing that can't be taken away. Not that I want you all to have struggles, <clears throat> but I want you to know you're going to. And when you have them, you just get in them. You get in deep. 
and you get on your knees and you boldly ask the Lord to fix it. And he does, he answers prayers. So my oldest daughter, and Maggie has given me permission to share this, but she struggled with anxiety. And in fifth grade, there were days that, I mean, I would pick her up from school and I would sit out in the parking lot and I would pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And then sure enough, they, they would call me to come get her. And I just didn't even know if we were gonna really make it through it, you know? Um, and now she's gonna be a counselor and she's gonna help people with anxiety because she gets it. And so you just have to let them go through their struggles and meet them where they are, love them through it and let the Lord use them in mighty ways. Nothing's perfect, I wish it was, but it's just not. Well, and you're not alone. Like, I remember calling as the mom, just bawling to whoever I was talking to on the phone. I felt like I was the only mom that was dealing with this. And so just know, whatever the situation, you're not alone. Like, there's, there's a lot of people out there that are struggling too. So, yeah, that's good. So if you're sitting here going, I might need help with this um, parenting stuff, we would love to help you. Um, you can call the office, you can reach out to Ashley. Um, but I think, you, I think you're doing a good job. I think you just gotta keep it going. Other thoughts or questions before we wrap up? Very good like, resources that you know for, uh, I'd say like one of my struggles when I get home, decompressing yeah. from work, shut it off, mm -hmm. be going into the house with patients yeah. love. Mm -hmm. So are there any resources that you know for that? Mm, that's a really good question. I'm going to have to think about that one. I always kind of feel like, for me, when I stayed home, the four to five o'clock is the hour of horribleness. Like, I don't know what it is. So when Ryan came home, I was like, here, take them. You know, I mean, there are times like every toy we owned was on the counter and he'd be like, rough day. And I'm like, yeah, thank Look at the kitchen. So, I mean, I know that there are times, you know, that, so I always, when I talk, to women, I always tell them um, a secret I used to do. Um, and I think this is gonna be recorded. I probably shouldn't say this, but I learned that um, if I filled the sink up with pine, with pine saw, like around four o'clock, I would just fill it up with pine saw and then I would just stir it for like an hour. I mean like, you know, go do something and come back and stir it. And then Ryan would come home and he would say, how'd you find time to mop? And I'd be like, hmm. I never said I did it. I just would always be like, hmm. You know, you just do. And you'd be like, babe, that's amazing. I'd be like, well, thanks, honey. <laughs> so you gotta do what you gotta do. But no, as far as men, I mean, I think it's hard. You guys have a hard, I mean, you've worked all day. You've been in meetings, you've been talking. Then you come home and it's expected for you to have this A game on to play. Um, the number one thing you can do with kids is wrestle. It's so important. Um, I always think dads need to wrestle more with kids. Um, it's a weird thing. I don't know how to wrestle, so I didn't ever enjoy that. So I kind of let that be my husband's thing. Um, if you, I think that would help your entire household. If you don't want to wrestle, we love to teach parents to make sandwiches. So you take your bottom cushion of your sofa, and that is um, a piece of bread, and then Jack can be a tomato, and I mean, you can even put them on top of each other. Henry can be bacon, whatever, and then a blanket. Don't cover up their faces. And then take the other cushion and put it on top of them and squish them. And I mean, don't squish them to death, but I, they will love it, I promise. And what that does is it releases deep pressure, it releases serotonin. Once that's released, it can be released for three to four hours. And it's a really good way to calm everybody down. Um, and so the deal with wrestling is the kids love it. And so you almost have to set a timer and they need to know your expectation. If the timer goes off, we're done wrestling. Um, and so set a timer, walk in, put on your dad hat, wrestle. And I think it's okay to set expectations my expectation is I'm gonna go change clothes and I wanna to talk to your mom for 10 minutes. So I'm gonna wrestle with you, the timer goes off, I'm gonna change clothes and I'm gonna to talk to your mom for 10 minutes and I don't wanna be interrupted. And that's okay, it's expectations, it's setting boundaries. So I think you just have to come up with what works best for your family. Releasing the serotonin is great because then they're ready for dinner. It'll get them to sit down still. I was also gonna mention, um, on Right Now Media, we had a marriage talk a yes. back, and he actually addresses this, because he talks to husbands and then wives, um, and he talks a little bit about parenting, and being a man and a dad, he had a unique perspective about that exact thing. So awesome. If you have it's, time, you may just hop on there. Yeah, it's Scott Johnson. Do you know who Scott Johnson is? Is he Red Rocks? Or is it? He, it's oh, a, yeah, no, he's not, but he's an incredible speaker. Mm -hmm. So you should listen to it. Yeah. 
Did you, Keely? Question? I was just going to add to your sandwich. Kendra told us to do the sandwich <laughs> like last week. And it, it, it helps. Like, my son always wanted to wrestle right before bed, and we found out that it's a sensory thing that that helps him to sleep all night. So he gets all this energy out. And then, so, but the sandwich helps too. It's almost like my husband doesn't have to wrestle as much. I'm like, hey, let's, you know, let's make a sandwich now. And then he's more calm. That's and crazy. a sandwich is like a lot faster than like wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, what is this? But I don't know. We use pillows. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. pillows are I mean, yeah, and we don't even put layers. We're like, I call it a personal okay. sandwich, and I, I get on it and roll it, and like literally 10 seconds. And I'm like, it works. It does. He just squishes it. I love it. They need squishes. Squish them, squish them. Just make sure they're breathing. But yes, I love it. I love it. What other thoughts or questions do you guys have? <clears throat> you have me. We have time. Yeah. What about if um, it seems like it doesn't matter how you ask or how you give choices for them to do what you're asking them to do? It's like they won't do it until you're angry and mm-hmm. yelling. Yeah. I think there just needs to be a consequence sooner. So I would try one, two, three magic. Have you ever read that book? It's a great book. Um, It teaches you to count. Some people disagree with that. They think first obedience. I think kids need a little grace. Um, So it's it's called one, two, three magic. It's really created for a classroom. But if you have a kid that's constantly being disobedient, you just count. You you ask them what to do. They don't do it. One. Now you have to know if that kid needs things repeated to process and understand it. You might need to repeat it. Two. And by the time you get to three, you kind of lower your voice. You don't yell it. By the time you get to three, if they haven't done it, there's a consequence. And you're gonna have to do that a lot. And then I promise you they're gonna start listening. It works. Yes. Can I add on to that? So what if like you're outside of the home, wherever it is, or like at the park? There's yeah. multiple of them. Yeah. And if one is not obeying and yeah. then the consequence like you have to leave. You leave. Because it's not safe or whatever. That's right. Like, that's not fair to the other one. Nope, but life's not fair. Yeah, I did it all the time. We would just be like, we're a family. We stick together. So-and-so was having a really rough day at Walmart. We're out of here. Yeah, so I came a little bit late. Sorry. Yeah, so the part about, like, the one coming to sit next to you and time in you do that, like, is, when is that appropriate to do and still, like, let the other one who was obeying still play the part? Yeah, that you can do that. No, you can totally try that. That's a great idea. If they're um, playing at the park and one just keeps being disobedient, this time you gotta have a time in, buddy. It's okay to do time out at the park. They hate time out at the park. It's okay to do that. You just say, I'm gonna, you're gonna sit right here. You're gonna take a time out until you regroup. This is your second warning. If you don't do it, we're leaving. And so you just have to kind of keep doing it. But they'll pick up on it. The more you're consistent with it, they'll pick up on it. I can't tell you how many times I love, there's something with Steinmart lights. My kids, every single time I went in that store had an issue. Um, Target, every once in a while in Target, I have left baskets full of groceries. I mean, I just, it's my expectation is for them to be well behaved. You know, they're not perfect. I didn't expect them to be perfect, but you're gonna have to leave that stuff. I mean, there are times I literally would pull my Walmart cart up and say, I am so sorry, there's a lot of frozen stuff in here, but we're leaving. You know, so you just have to kind of stick with it. So time ins work great. And then if that doesn't work, put them in a timeout. The reason they don't like timeouts is because um, what happened is we would set, put them in timeout. We learned to set a timer for their minutes they were born. So if they're two, they get two minutes. Put them in timeout, the buzzer would go off and we'd say, Jack, you can get out. And Jack would get out. Jack didn't learn anything, right? So if you're gonna do timeout, and I don't really even care if like the two minutes per age, I'm not a real big fan of that. It's really, 30 seconds is a long time for them. Just get them out, get them away, make them slow down. And then once they are calmed down, then you go up to them and say, buddy, why are you in timeout? And you explain to them, well, you did this, you affected this emotion, and this is what you could have done different. I expect to see a different next time. High five, and you're done. You have to explain it to them. <clears throat> That's why they kind of did away with timeouts is because it was, we weren't teaching them. We were just sending them away, you know. So, and that has absolutely nothing to do with a kid with trauma. That's a whole nother ball game. Um, that's just a typical neurodeveloped child. So. Yeah. All related to 
What about rewards versus consequences? Like yeah, I was waiting for someone to ask me about that. Um, so my opinion on that is there is a reason we all go to work and get a paycheck, right? We live in a reward society. Chances are our kids are going to probably have a job and get a paycheck. So I'm okay with rewards. There's a difference between bribes and rewards, right? So we hear it a lot here. So, I mean, I expect the kid to come sit down and play games and follow my order. They should be able to do that. Um, and we'll hear parents say, well, get ice cream if you just listen to her. Well, no, don't get ice cream. Like, that's a bribe, right? But if they, if they know your expectation and you do this, this, and this, then a reward is great. I think some kids really thrive off of rewards. So I think you have to know your kids. My kids were never huge on rewards, um, but some kids do great with rewards. We've done charts and behavior, like visual reward systems with some behaviors, and they do excellent with that. So it just depends on the kid. But I'm not a, I'm a, I agree with rewards. I think we live in a reward society. We just want them to work hard. We don't want them to work to get the reward. We want them to work hard and then get the reward. That's the only difference. So, what was your question? I will be having four, um, four and under. So, Ooh, girl. We, when we go to the grocery store, you know, they eat yeah. in the cart. Yeah. What would be a type of discipline? Yeah. Because you can't do timing. You can't. No. You can't do so, I think the main thing is they need to be busy. So for you, I would get a baggie, and if you eat, I mean, I don't know what you eat, but let's say you eat Oreos, I would cut the package out when they're gone. If you have a certain cereal, I would cut that box out, and I would put it in the baggie. And when you go down that aisle, I would pull it out and have your kids look on the aisle and help you find the items. I mean, they need to be helpers. They really do. Now, four and under, you might have like a one, an infant or something. They can't be helpers. But your four-year-old can, and probably your two-and-a-half or three-year-old can. Um, as far as discipline you just have to let them know your expectations and you have to do short trips like it you can't keep you can't do your whole shopping in one time so I would do short trips I would let them know your expectations make it fun say all right here we are we pulled up a Walmart I'm gonna set my stopwatch we're getting three items you're in charge of bread you're in charge of milk I'm gonna get eggs and someone help me with sissy she's gonna get whatever turkey and then you go get those things and then you're like, okay, wait, what was Sissy in charge of? Like, let them be your helpers. And if they, they have a responsibility, they'll do really well. It's when they get bored, they just start touching everything. Another thing we did is we never bought them anything off the stores. We spoiled them Christmas, birthdays, but just day-to-day -day shopping, they never got anything. I know that sounds crazy, but I just started it early. We never bought them. I don't care if it was like the best bubble gum looking thing ever. We would just be like, yeah, you can ask for your birthday for that. That does look really good. Put it up. Um, and we never gave in on that. We never bought them anything. Um, and it really saved me a lot of headache. I started, I had a precious old wise woman tell me that and I was like, I'll try it. And it just kind of worked. So, but then they grow up and they know how to do Amazon. So it changes. What other thoughts do you guys have? Has this been helpful? It's a lot of information, I know. Um, but I think you just have to figure out your boundaries, your expectations, what are going to be your household rules. And so there's no way tomorrow you can wake up and implement all of this, or you're going to do it for one day and be like, I'm exhausted and we're done. I'm not listening to one thing that lady said. But you can implement a little bit at a time. So draw your house, figure out what your boundaries are, figure out what your expectations are. Um, and we'll go from there. Does that sound good? Last time, any thoughts or questions? I just have a quick question then on um, how, do, how do you break them of these? Like, I don't know, I can't wake up tomorrow and be like, okay, we're not gonna watch TV while we're eating, we're not gonna go to the store, you know, you're not gonna get anything when you go to the store. Like, that would be awful. Like, right. how, like, like I love it, you say you never started, but what if you have started right. and then I try to break a bunch of these? Yeah. So I think you set little tasks. So you explain to him, all right, buddy, we're going into Target, but you have to make it successful. We're going into Target to get one item. I don't know, ponytail holders. I mean, whatever, one item. And say, you're not gonna get anything. That's my expectation is we're not gonna buy you anything. And I need you to know that. You're gonna see things you want, and I'm gonna say, nope, not today. And that's a reminder, not today. Are you ready to do this? We're gonna do it together, let's go. And you go in, you buy your one thing, he's gonna find something, you're gonna be like, remember? Nope, not today. So be consistent with your wording. Nope, not today. High five, let's go. And then you get in the car and you praise him. Say, you did it. I 
did it. We didn't buy it. That's going to really help our household because you're going to save us a lot of money. And you just start little. And be consistent with your wording. So then you go and you get two or three items and you just tell them your expectation. Um, and you just be consistent with it. And you don't give in. And there will be times he screams bloody murder and that's okay. You carry him to the car. And then just say, buddy, I'm so sorry, but remember I, I explained to you in the car we weren't going to get anything. And so you just have to teach them. And start little, make it successful, and then just keep making it bigger and bigger. As far as discipline, you want them to learn to follow one, two-step commands. So um, just when they don't want something, it doesn't mean that they don't get their way. And so you just have to, you have to tell them what you want, physically touch them, connect that neuron, and then ask them if they want you to help them do that or do they want to do it on their own. And he's going to throw a big fit and say, well, I guess you need my help. I'm going to help you. And so you go do it and you just, you do it very slowly and gently and keep doing it and keep doing it. He'll figure it out. He's smart. What do you mean by connect that neuron? Yeah, so research shows that conversation skills, say if you touch them, then anywhere on their leg or on their arm, it connects these little neurons in their brain and it teaches them back and forth conversation. So when we roll the ball, we'll it touch their foot and say, roll it back to me, and they'll roll it and then we'll bounce it and say, now bounce it to me, and we want them to bounce it. And so it's them learning to listen, it's called active listening, learning to actively listen and be able to do a command and follow your command. So, I mean, really, I kind of think a two-year-old should do a two-step command, a three-year-old should do a three-step, a four-year-old should do a four-step. I mean, these kids should be able to follow order and directions. We don't give them enough directions. When I teach that to them, I get a cup and I get my stuff out and I ask them to do this stuff. Every single time the parents are like, I had no idea he could do that. And I'm like, he can. They can do it. We just have to teach it. So the more you give them those directions, I mean, praise them. Praise them and high-five them. Those are big skills. Tell them, man, I respect that brain of yours. God made that really awesome. It works really well. That's what that is. It's a good question. Okay, I'm going to let Ashley pray. Pray us out. Um, and then, do you, every, you have everyone's email. Mm -hmm. We can send, yeah. like, chore list. Yeah, I've got a list. Okay, got it. She'll, she'll do it. She's awesome. Okay, I'm going to let her pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for tonight. I thank you for getting to learn and grow. I thank you for the children that you've given us. Um, help us to digest all of this. Help us to remember what you want us to remember, God, and help us to just slow down and um, be a little less hurried and implement some of these things to be better parents for the kids that you've given us. We love you and praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.